Hi everyone. Welcome to the Zoom and Zoom Art podcast. A podcast where three woefully underqualified gapper and now incoming freshman students talk about uh in, in compelling ideas, interview interesting guests and try to take key insights from these conversations that we can possibly apply in our daily lives. Uh I'm I'm Aryan Chaudhary and I'm joined with my co-hosts Akash Vikram Shroff and Parth Bihani. So today we're going to be talking to you about procrastination. Why procrastination? Because being three 19 years 19 year olds, we do that a lot, like a lot. In fact, while starting our podcast, we procrastinated quite a bit on that as well, right? So we thought that today we could discuss um, different ways in which we procrastinate and how you can figure out why you procrastinate and figure out techniques to solve that, right? And to start off with, what is procrastination loosely, right? It's just the action of delaying something that you should be doing now, that you rationally should be doing now, for various reasons. And we're going to take you through how you can, in fact, recognize that and stop that. So I think, like, obviously one of the biggest examples in which all three of us procrastinated together was while starting this podcast. But are there any other instances where either of you have noticed where you've procrastinated a lot? Definitely. I I think this podcast is a very good example of um, when we procrastinated. And I think that's something that we can find a lot of value in, at least in terms of what our listeners should not be doing. But um, in terms of understanding procrastination, I think one resource that's very helpful is something called the procrastination equation by this very famous author called Pierre Steele. And it's it's from his book in 2010. We'll have it linked down below. But what this equation tries to do is um, set out different facets of procrastination or different things that might cause you to procrastinate. So um, for all of our people listening on audio only, I'm going to try to do my best to explain this um, equation to you. But basically, the equation is a ratio. So on the numerator, you have expectancy times value. And on the denominator, you have impulsiveness times delay. Now, the larger this value gets, that means the larger the numerator is compared to the denominator, you're less likely to procrastinate. While the smaller it gets, you are more likely to procrastinate. Now, we'll be going through each of these terms in depth and explaining to you what each of them mean. But in a general sense, expectancy basically means how good you think you are at the task or how much do you think you can succeed at what you're doing. Value is basically what value does the task provide to you? What reward do you get from doing the task? And then on the other side, you have impulsiveness, which all of us have experienced how likely you are to get (laughs) distracted while you're doing the task. And delay is how much you can put off doing the task. So um, just as a disclaimer, I know it's very difficult to um, mathematically model any sort of human behavior. But at least for me, I find this equation is really helpful because it gives you the opportunity to sort of hack your brain. Because if you can figure out what part of procrastination you're particularly struggling with like is it impulsiveness do you find yourself getting very distracted easily then it's quite easy to try to tackle that individually and at least for our podcast uh example uh for me personally i had a lot of issues with expectancy the expectancy was low so what that means uh, where expectancy again is how much do you think you'll succeed at a task to be honest, I didn't think the three of us would succeed at <laughs> at starting a podcast. <laughs> I didn't think that we were qualified enough, hence our woefully underqualified tag. Nor did I think that we were insightful enough to do this. I thought it would be very pretentious coming off. But um, that's why we were we procrastinated it, because the expectancy was low. And therefore, the value of the ratio was low. So... Let's get into expectancy, I guess. It's a natural segue. So once again, expectancy is how confident or how likely you are to complete the task at hand. So do you all have any issues that you've had with expectancy in the past? Yeah, for sure, Akasha. That makes a lot of sense because when you expect that you might fail 
at some task, you get this certain fear of doing it because you're not sure that you might succeed and you think that that could have numerous negative ramifications, right? So one example, I think, for me was while writing certain college essays <laughs> um, where I delayed them to very, very late. I think I submitted one at 11.58 p.m. for a 12 a.m. deadline, which was cutting it really close. But I think one of the factors could have been this entire idea of expectancy, right? About being scared about not succeeding and getting into those places. And because of that, I think it's it, that fear of failure really immobilizes you to some extent. And one thing is recognizing that you're going through something like this could definitely help you figure out how to get over it, right? Because when you think that you're going to f fail so badly at it, you realize at one point that, hey, if I don't start at all, I'm anyways going to fail, right? Yeah. But just recognizing that, I think, is definitely the first step in figuring out your expectancy for a certain task. What about you, Arihant? Have you gone through this? Uh, I think I can really relate to when you say uh, that, uh, you know, uh, when we were writing all, all our college essays and because I took a gap year, I think I had to write it twice, <laughs> um, um, unless, uh, unlike Akash. But I think, um, yeah, the fear of failing is something that really sometimes holds me back from even starting a task. I think sometimes, you know, the, the want to succeed and the fear of failing gets me at this stuck point where I think that, you know, I, I'd probably not start because I want to achieve a lot from this task and I think I won't be able to. Does this make sense to you? Uh, definitely. And I think that um, corresponds a lot with this theory by Nick Vogue and we'll have it linked down below. It's called the self-worth theory. And it, it's a very complicated, lot of graphs, but the simplest way I can explain it is that you don't start a task because you associate your self-worth with how you succeed, with, your, with the result. Basically, you associate your self-worth with the ability that you have. So if you don't think you're good at something, you, do, you tend to not gravitate towards trying it out because you think you're a failure. Even though it doesn't indicate in any such way that you are a failure, it just means that you have a lot more to learn in that task. And I think recognizing that is a very important step because then you can understand that, you know what, I'm having this issue where I feel that my self-worth is attached too much to how I succeed at something. And recognizing that allows you to try to separate it where you can understand that maybe it doesn't actually, my self-worth doesn't actually depend on how well I do at something. And it's only my ability. It's only a reflection of my ability. And it's a good thing if I fail, because that means I just have a lot more to improve on. But yeah, expectancy is definitely something that I've struggled with and that I'm sure many people have struggled with as well. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think this whole failure thing ties back to our big theme of our podcast as well, right? Because we're really scared of failure. And that's why we have this fear of expectancy, which is something that through our guests, we're trying to figure out how to overcome and why failure isn't a bad thing. And I think that's what a lot of our guests have been um, talking about as well. Really, definitely. And um, there's a, just another thing that I remembered. So there's this video that I was watching on YouTube. I mean, one of my many YouTube binges. But there's this really famous channel, uh, which I love a lot, called Yes Theory. And um, in a particular section or a particular series of videos, there's the main character from the main person from Yes Theory is trying to put himself through various fitness related challenges. So he starts off with a half marathon, then he runs a marathon, then he runs a half Ironman and a full Ironman. And even, I didn't know what an Ironman was, so I had to look it up. But basically, it's a very, very grueling uh, physical challenge. So you have a two mile swim, roughly, followed by 110 miles on the bike, followed by a full marathon, which is another 26 miles of running. And that is an immense feat. But so during the whole series, he speaks about how at every stage, he didn't think he could do it He's, because he didn't think he was one of those people who was into fitness, one of those people who'd wake up in the morning at five to go train to do something like this, who train for six hours a day. 
And a very powerful point in the video where he does the Iron Man is when he's reading a letter from one of his friends. And his friend who's doing the Iron Man with him is explaining to him how the idea that he has of himself is holding him back. So we all get these beliefs of ourselves. We construct them in our head that, oh, I'm the sort of person who does this or I'm the sort of person who doesn't do this. And while these beliefs might actually seem useful because they're helping you define who you are, I think we don't realize how um, constricting they actually are. Because once you've got in your head that, oh, I'm not the kind of person who can wake up at five to to do something, to train, to for it. example. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you're never going to be yeah. able to do that. So realizing that you've had this belief and tackling that belief, like trying to remove that at its very core, is something that's a very powerful, it's, it's philosophical and quite pretentious coming from three 19-year-olds. But I definitely encourage you to watch the Yes Theory video so that you get a better idea of it. And I found that very moving. But yeah. Yeah, so also with the procrastination equation, I think, Akash, you mentioned about value, right? Um, that we can also try to increase the value that a certain task has, like uh, the, the meaning that it has for ourselves to pro probably reduce our uh, motives to procrastinate the task. Uh, have you guys ever tried to increase the value? Have you ever thought that you've increased value like while not noticing or not knowing about the equation? Uh, well, for sure. I think one thing that I've felt and seen really strongly about value is First of all, figuring out what tasks have meaning to me, right? Because you often find yourself when you're procrastinating, you're filling your day up with a lot of small tasks which might seem productive, but they're not actually productive, right? You're checking your email, you might be cleaning your room, or rearranging your drawers like five times just to fill your day up, mm -hmm. but you're not doing the tasks that actually um, have value because you haven't recognized where the value is. So the first step to figuring out, like figuring this whole thing out is recognizing what has value to you, what doesn't have value, and then figuring out what you can do with this, right? Because when you figure out that something actually has value, now remember the procrastination equation, value is on the numerator, right? So if you're able to associate this value with it and figure that out, the equation says you generally would be more likely to complete this task because it is more meaningful for you. Hmm. Hmm. Definitely. Uh, and I think an important thing to recognize there is that sometimes the value of a task can be quite misleading because this is the apparent value. So this is what you think the task has value to you. Mm. And our human brain is very good at uh, just taking the short term value of things without fully recognizing the long term value. So for example, if you want to work out the value that you get instantly that you see is an hour of physical torture and grueling pain and muscle soreness the day after. You don't necessarily see the value that's the intangible value, which is a better lifestyle, for example, or a healthier lifestyle. So it's very important, I think, to sometimes try to hack that in the sense that you add value to it and add very concrete, tangible value. So for example, if you work out, then you make a deal with yourself that if I work out, then I will do this, for example, maybe eat something that you wanted to eat guilt-free. So that's something that's very important because then you're providing a very real immediate value to some tasks which don't have immediate value. And you're tricking your brain into understanding that, okay, maybe this task is actually worthwhile rather than the the uh, the pain that you see in front of you with respect to the workout. Yeah, definitely. That, that makes a lot of sense. And I think there was this one table that I saw that um, resonated with me a lot, right? And it, it was a grid, again, <laughs> for our audio listeners, I shall try explaining this the best I can. But it's a grid <laughs> with four squares, right? And on top, you have urgent and not urgent as the two uh, columns. And on the side, as the two rows, you have important and not important, right? So you can imagine each of the four boxes corresponds to two terms. So it could be not important and not urgent, urgent and not important, and so on. 
Now, if you map out your tasks through a week, say, for example, just general things you've done into this box, and important means something that's important to you towards your goals, towards your life, and so on. Urgent, obviously, is relating to a time-bound constraint. What you realize is a lot of things that we end up doing fall within this not urgent and not important box, right? Just things that, I mean, so not important, but urgent. Right? Not important, but urgent. Things that in the immediate vicinity seem that they have to be done, that the only thing that we need to focus our attention on. But in a bigger picture kind of way, it, it really doesn't matter that much. Mm. But they just end up taking most of our mental energy and space. But a box that we really discount is the urgent, I mean, not urgent, but important, things that are important for your life. Maybe you have a certain goal. Maybe you want to start a blog. Maybe you want to try running your own startup, right? All of these things might be important to you, but they don't have any time-bound constraint. They're not urgent in any way, right? And because of that, again, like Akash was saying, you, your apparent value that your brain has assigned to it is not corresponding to the real value that this has for your life. Right? And because of that, you often miss out on doing these tasks and figuring out, I think when I tried this, in fact, like over a week, using this table to see where you spent most of your time and where, in fact, you want to be spending it instead could be a way of figuring this out. But I think this, this beautifully leads us to our next segment as well about impulsiveness. Right? Because what is impulsiveness? Impulsiveness is how likely are you to be sidelined to do something that's immediately gratifying, right? To do something that seems really urgent but is not actually important. And the more likely you are to do this, the less likely you are to actually get what you want done. Right? So what do you guys think about impulsiveness? So um, I think I want to come back to my gap here, uh, although it's almost over now. Um, so with when you're given like so much time, you really don't have a lot of stuff like in that pretty urgent category that um, that Pat was just speaking about. So it's really important for you to understand where you want to take yourself in this one in this time that you have. For me, it was my gap year. So uh, what I tried to do was I tried to I tried to create a cre creative visualization of myself at the beginning of my gap year that this is where I want to be after this year is over. And then I compared it to my current position and tried to make like small tasks and stuff and also reduce the distraction that would get there. So, um, and, and while I was doing this, I was also trying to like read a little bit about how I can optimize my whole process for the gap year. And um, I came by this thing uh, in this uh, came by this this one really nice technique that helped me in my gap year in this book that I uh, read by James Clear. It's a really famous book. It's called Atomic Habits, about how you can use choice choice points in your uh, in your day uh, to make good or bad choices. So essentially, if there are some some things that will take you to your ideal self, those those tasks or those choices are good choices and there are some things which don't take you towards your ideal self and those are like very obviously bad choices now i want to increase like the number of good choice days that i had and what i learned from the book was i can't it's 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 okay to make some bad choices or like get sidelined sometimes or like not always do like the productive stuff but you, you, you probably want to maximize on the, the, to, the overall good choices in a day that would lead you to probably getting less sidetracked. Um, and, and, that, and since, since you can also set up like a rewarding system, like Akash mentioned for yourself, like rewarding something, rewarding yourself, for like small tasks. So th that's something which I use to like reduce my impulsiveness. Do you think you used something or like, do you experience, uh, impulsiveness as well? Yeah, so at least for me, I, I find that idea of having like a visualization of yourself where it's somewhere you want to be very good. And in the long run, it's very useful. But I still think that short term, that's in the very moment, that sort of visualization falls um, a little flat because of how easily I get distracted by things. So I've and and trying to overcome distraction is a massive skill which you build up so you you have to 
build up slowly. But a common situation that I find myself in, and I think a lot of people experience this, so there's even a fun name attached to it. It's called analysis paralysis. Basically, what that means is before starting any task, Mm -hmm. you circle around that task as much as you can. So suppose the task is starting a blog, as Bart mentioned earlier, you circle around it. What's the best blog site I should use? Once you identify it, you're like, no, actually, what if that wasn't good? I'm going to go check that again. Then you're like, wait, but if I want a blog, I need a keyboard, right? I can't, obviously, I can't type on my laptop keyboard that isn't professional enough. I need a keyboard, a mechanical one that actually makes it seem like I'm fit to run a blog. And then you're like, what's the need? And then you got that. And you're like, but if I have a keyboard... Yeah, exactly. Then you're like, what's the name of the blog? (laughs) I need a mouse. Exactly. I mean, if you have a keyboard that's external, you can't have a mouse that's not external. Can't be Mm -hmm. using that trackpad. So then, then what's the graphics for the blog going to be? And some of these decisions are important, obviously, but a lot of them aren't. And I think the issue lies, at least for me, when I was able to identify it, was um, that I was treating each decision equally. So each and every decision had the same value in my life. It was so a decision such as what blog system should I use? What software should I use? And do I need a, an external keyboard? Those were given the same value. So each of them were just as likely to sidetrack me. So oh, a very important step in overcoming this uh, analysis paralysis was understanding that each decision actually isn't equal. And some decisions are just a lot more important than others. And once you've got those out of the way, it's very important to just get started, regardless of whether you think the quality is not going to be good or something. Like even with this podcast for the first few episodes, our audio and mic mic quality was atrocious. But as but we three decided we were like we still have to get something out because it's if we never keep trying happen. to wait for everything yeah. to be perfect, we're never going to achieve that. Yeah, we're never. So you just have to get started, and once you get yourself started, then it's a lot easier yeah. to pick up on and the keep idea moving. of getting started in distractions, right? So obviously, this is one type of distractions where you're circling around your task. The other type of distraction is when you're doing just complete something completely different, right? You go down on YouTube spiral, you go start <laughs> binging a show and things like that and again for those tasks your short-term impulsiveness is really high right so it's really easy to get distracted so at least for me what I found is the best way to stop that is by having certain uh, mechanisms that you use by like leveraging technology to stop yourself from being able to do that in the first place right so one example could be blocking notifications efficiently the other example I think there's this app that I really like called self-control Um, which you download on your laptop and you can put certain sites into it, right? For example, you type youtube.com and put it for like 12 hours. During those 12 hours, it'll block YouTube and no matter what browser you try to use it on, even if you try to uninstall the (laughs) self-control app, YouTube will be blocked, right? Just putting in like small things like that because when you eliminate all of these impulsive distractions, then when you're left with just the actual things that you need to do, you're a lot more likely to end up doing them because you don't have anything else to just fall back on and start watching again. Um, yeah, so what, what do you think, Ar- Uh So yeah, this also brings <laughs> me back to something that I read in the book that Akash mentioned from which we got our equation. Uh, Pierre Steele actually said that you can get an extra month's work done by just like getting 10% more efficient in an entire year. So, uh, and also in Atomic Habits, I think James Clear says that if you improve yourself by 1% every day, um, you get you get 37 times better in a year, which is absolutely ridiculous when you when you think about, uh, you know, how, how something like a small task, like just, just managing your notifications or like just working towards being more efficient can get you. But, uh, but I, what I'm really interest, uh, interesting in like, discussing is also the delay part of the equation. So we've spoken about expectancy, which we ideally want to increase. We've spoken about value that we also want to increase. We want to decrease our impulsiveness like we just discussed. But also there's the delay term. What do you think about that, Akash? Um, definitely, because let me, let me paint a picture for you, which I think we've all experienced. But... Suppose you have a deadline that's four weeks away and there's a task that you have to do and you've got a four-week deadline because 
the teacher or whoever's giving you that task is pretty sure that it'll take you four weeks to complete without scrambling. So um, the first week you're like, no, four weeks away, I'm good. Then that 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 never decreases. The second week you're like, three weeks, that's more than enough time. Because our effort expands to fill the time that we're given. And so what happens is the night before, you're stuck doing four weeks of work because you haven't been able to bring yourself to start. And this is something we discussed with Kevin quite a bit. And um, our episode with Kevin Wong, uh, please do check that out. That's in the description. And he spoke about how instead of studying, he rewatched an entire anime series. So a deadline or a, a delay is something that can derail your progress just by virtue of how far a deadline is and i think trying to build the discipline is something that's very important there so you have to sort of if you have a big task that's in four weeks what i like to do is break it up into small tasks that have a deadline of a day or two max which i cannot possibly find any solace to delay so i need to um either figure out what I have to do for that particular task and then just keep trying to achieve those small checkpoints and then ultimately um, arrive at the bigger task. But I think building that discipline is very important. So you could try to build that discipline in a number of ways. So what I found useful for myself in the past is the idea of cold showers. And I think this might this might at first sound slightly unrelated, but it's actually quite intuitive. So you're effectively, you're trying to make yourself more accountable to yourself. You are trying to avoid that justification that happens whenever you want to avoid the task. So whenever you skip out on something, there's that little voice in the back of your brain that goes, you know what, actually that was okay. I can just avoid it. It's fine, I'll still get it done. So. I've tried to force myself to take cold showers and I've been doing so for the better part of a couple months now. And um, the entire point isn't that, oh, cold showers, health benefits, blah, blah, blah. There are health benefits. But I wanted to do it because there's just that moment every single morning where you push yourself out of your comfort zone and you have to do it. You build up the ability to resist saying, you know what, actually it's cold today. I'm going to avoid this cold shower. I'll I'll probably fall sick. So <laughs> you build up the resistance to that justification in the back of your head. And that's helped me a lot with delay as well. Because once now I know that once I've put a deadline in place, I'm going to follow it because I don't give myself any other choice, really. So yeah, yeah. I, I think that's really cool. I definitely want to try it. I mean, in fact, it reminds me of a Yes Theory video as well where they... Um, talk about ice baths and they they actually do I think a similar yeah. thing to what you're doing but slightly more extreme while having um, <laughs> ice slightly baths just morning. very slightly <laughs> <laughs> but but that's a really cool idea of having this thing that you have to do that you have to get out of your comfort zone and building up that muscle I guess like th there's so many things like apart from physical muscles right for example I mean I'm sure all of you have heard that improv in theater is a muscle right and I feel like definitely this as well uh, putting yourself outside your comfort zone, not falling into this trap of delay and in into this cycle is also another muscle that you have to practice. Hmm. Uh, so I think I think we've discussed the equation uh, quite a bit now, but I, but I think what I really want to hear is: uh, oh, Are there any uh, techniques that you use for to maximize your productivity or curb your product procrastination? Have you used any path? Um, yeah, for sure. I think apart from the ones that we've been mentioning, one that I really like is um, this two minute rule by Ali Abdal. He's another great YouTuber that we can link down below. But basically the idea is that if you have any task, that's only going to take two minutes to do, right? Maybe it's refilling your water bottle. That's something that just for that two minutes, you need to force yourself to do it because it's a really small task. You need to like build that habit again that of not dealing something. When it's just two minutes, you're going to do it. That That's the rule you've set for yourself, right? Again, this deals with your natural impulsiveness delay and so on. And the other part of this rule is, is there's something, a task that, that's longer than two minutes. Maybe it's writing your next blog post. Maybe it's doing a certain homework problem set, 
right? For that, the rule that you create for yourself is that you're going to, at this point, even if you don't feel like doing it, do only five minutes of it, and then you're allowed guilt-free to stop doing it if you want, right? But why is this really useful? Because one of our biggest barriers to doing something is that fear of starting, the fear of actually getting on with it in the first place, right? Instead of circling around, bang, like your keyboard or your mouse and so on, just getting the task started. <laughs> and it's often shown that once you start doing something, it's a lot easier to continue doing it, right? So if you follow this two and five minute rule, um, I found that it, in fact, really helps start and keep doing a task that you like to without having that immense pressure before you started that, oh my God, this is so much work, I can't do it because you don't have such a huge expectation right from the onset. What about you, Akash? Uh, definitely, I think that that's a very useful rule and um, that just getting that initial push with the five minute rule or say using a Pomodoro timer, which we discussed in our episode with uh, GP, uh, is something that's very effective in getting you started with a task and just then having that task, it just flows. Now, uh, another thing that I like to do is to schedule fun. Now, a very common scenario um, that I'm sure we've all experienced is when you have, say, a particular task to do, which is very important, you try to starve yourself of other things. You're like, okay, until I get this paper done, I won't watch any TV or I won't watch a particular show that I've been really dying to watch that I have to binge watch. Um, and what that, what it seems to do on the surface is, okay, this is actually good. You're, you're like avoiding this. You're going to force yourself to work. And then as a reward, you'll do this. But counterintuitively, what I found happens with me is that while I'm do, supposed to be doing my task, all I can do is either think about what I'm uh, depriving myself of what I'm saying that I will not watch or I'm spending the rest of my time partaking in like low density fun which is basically just mindless activities as Path mentioned before so scrolling through my Instagram feed or uh, YouTube shorts all the different short form <laughs> content that is now there to, to captivate your attention and so when you think you've actually done an amount of work, you haven't. You've just spent your time doing all this mindless stuff and you don't feel guilty about it because you don't realize you're doing it. You haven't got any work done, but you also haven't done anything fun. So you're at a net negative than when you started. You haven't achieved anything, basically. So um, what I like to do is schedule out my fun instead of schedule out high density fun. So instead of saying that I won't do something, I won't watch this show, uh, what I find more useful is to say, you know what, let me work till five. And then from five to say seven, or however long you want it to be, I'm going to just watch this show, I'm going to chill out, watch the show, maybe work out whatever I actually want to do. And what that creates in my head is first anticipation because I'm I'm like, okay, I'm going to get to do this. So it's good. Second, there's a degree of guilt in case I don't do my work because I'm like, I need to do this so that I can properly enjoy that. So, so scheduling fun, I found, and I also don't fall into those low density fun traps because I don't need to distract myself. I'm looking forward to something and my work, it doesn't sound as bad as it does right now. So that's something that's really helped me before. Hmm. You know, sometimes I try, when, when I'm beginning a task, I sometimes feel that I'm not motivated enough to, to begin a task. Have you guys felt similar uh, things like me? Um, yeah, I think motivation is definitely something that is something that all of us um, have a very unhealthy relationship <laughs> with. But just basing your entire progress, your entire expectation on this initial motivation is not something that I think is really useful, right? And especially because motivation isn't necessarily something that you always have. And if you focus entirely on the starting motivation, it can be another excuse to not do something or another way in which you don't end up doing it. But instead of having certain motivating factors, it's a lot better to build up habits, right, which you can use to do certain tasks. And I think, Akash, you can talk about this more in detail, how these habits, in fact, work. Yeah, 
Definitely, because um, this is something that I believe very strongly in. And in the first episode that we filmed, we spoke about the two-day rule. Yeah. And um, that's basically a system wherein you try to build accountability to yourself. Mm-hmm. And it's very useful because you're going to have low days. You're going to have days where you can't possibly motivate yourself. And so relying on motivation is a very double-edged sword because it gives you highs. Sometimes you're very motivated, but that's not very often. And the lows are a lot more common where you're just like, okay, today I just can't get myself to do it. It's fine. I'll be motivated again someday. But motivation isn't something that should drive you. It should be discipline. And I will be linking a number of resources below, but one really important one that I mentioned, uh, like I said before, is the two-day rule where you allow yourself to have an off day. You can do it. It's fine. Everyone gets off days, but you can't do it for two days in a row. So what that does is it takes the result of any activity out of the equation. It takes your motivation out of the equation because you know that I need to be accountable to myself. So I have to do this. And somehow I found that while you're doing a task, the motivation comes to you once you get a certain level at it. So if I'm not motivated to work at, if I just go start working at 10, 15 minutes in, I'm raring to go more than I would have if I just waited for the motivation. So that's something I think that's very important, building the discipline and trying to take motivation out of the equation entirely. Again, it's that that fear of failure, that fear of starting that stops you from starting. But once you've started it, you get a lot more motivated to do it. And I think another thing that our brains really look for are results right? Even though that should not be the ideal case. But for example, in working out, you don't see results immediately like the next day after you first worked out. It takes like a few weeks or a month, right? And it's because our brains want to see immediate results that we often don't have the same motivation. So it's really important to have some amount of discipline and a habit that takes you through this time until you reach a point at which you can see results actually coming out. Um, yeah, what, what, else, what other techniques do you have in mind, Aryan? Uh, so I think um, one is, I think before we wrap up, I also, because we've rambled on for quite some time, I, 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 I hope there's somebody procrastinating hearing our episodes, <laughs> but uh, um, I'm kidding guys. Uh, uh, I think one of the things that really helped me uh, in like my gap year stuff and like before that was I, I generally enjoyed or like was productive at tasks when I was having fun with it. And uh, I think I think this is something that I think all of us can increase uh, like doing if you're already doing it. Uh, it's just having the, the just just have fun with it mindset. That's something which I like to call it, in which we basically increase the expectancy because if you're having fun with it, you're more confident to like you know complete the task. Um, a fun task is generally a doable task, uh, and also the impulsiveness decreases because if it's fun, then you're probably not going to get distracted. So again, this might not be an exact way to like hack into your brain, uh, but I think this is something that can possibly help while you know starting a task. De- definitely, uh, and and I think something you've mentioned is really important because um, even the value increases as yeah. you have fun with it. Because then you're not just looking forward to the result of the task. The task. The itself. task is yeah. more fun itself. So trying to find ways that you can do the same thing but more fun is is very important so suppose you want to get into working out find something that you actually like doing don't just try to do it if you want to learn programming then find a resource that actually benefits you depending on your and, learning and do it style. with friends do it with someone else who's also having fun along with you um, yeah. and figure out these systems and i think yeah that that's definitely something because it also decreases your impulsiveness you're not looking for other fun things to do because this itself is fun right so um <laughs> before we go on for way too long um i think like a few key takeaways is recognizing this procrastination productivity equation right where you have expectation into value into numerator divided by impulsiveness into delay and figuring out which one of these four or multiple blocks are you struggling with right because once you figure that out then you can figure out which technique is the most helpful for you be it adding fun adding accountability figuring out a discipline and obviously not all of this will stick but if it's one idea from my side i think it's figuring out which part you need to figure out for yourself 
and then figuring out the technique instead of trying like all sorts of random techniques because there's so many that if you just google you'll come up with a list of like 50 different techniques <laughs> to stop procrastination right yeah. but maybe yeah. 30 of them don't affect you because you've already crossed that point yeah um so yeah are there just any final thoughts that either of you would like to leave our audience with before we wrap up so um we have a number of resources that you can use as part set to find the technique that uh is best suited for you depending on what facet of this equation applies to you and we're going to be linking them all in the description so please use that we'll link out the original book that we got this equation from and another very uh, enjoyable podcast called the college info geek which i listen to which goes a lot more in depth into the equation and all of the different parts but again it's just about figuring out which one affects you and trying to tweak it remember small changes can build up a lot more than you think and it's always a process like I've dealt with procrastination before and I've managed to overcome it a little bit but that doesn't mean there won't be days where I'll still just feel like shit and want to procrastinate and not do anything and it's about identifying that those days will happen and there isn't much and you can okay do about once it in a while. yeah they they're perfectly okay it's okay to procrastinate but it you also need to try to figure out if you think it's a very big issue for you that you can't possibly work with how to best go about dealing with it but uh, aryan is there anything you'd like to say before we end this yeah i just want to like wrap up the whole discussion for today uh so for for everybody who's made it we spoke about expectancy value impulsiveness and delay along with some techniques that we can use uh to like possibly work on one of these or some of these uh terms i think we akash also we we really we really spoken about a lot of resources so i think this episode is going to be really flooded with a lot of links which you should check out <laughs> but again i think a really nice um, idea that one of my mentors during my gap year told me was about measuring productivity over weeks and months and not days because sometimes it can get really hard Uh, on ourselves when we when we get obsessed with this whole idea of productivity so yeah that's that's a uh, that's an idea that i want to leave you guys with thank you so much for listening um we'll see you again in a future episode bye bye, bye.